All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or what time ever of the day it may be for you guys. Today we got a kind of a special video because this is gonna be a pretty hardcore training video. And what we're gonna be doing is I'm at Patio Town, I'm with my good buddy, Jim. Uh, and what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be walking through all of those technical aspects of building a retaining wall that I typically just brush through. And what these are is these are the skills that go into building corners, the skills that it requires to understand how to create a set of stairs like like this, how you split the blocks to build columns. Jim and I and the team from Versalock are gonna be creating this training series or this training video so that if you're a business owner and you have a new guy coming into your company, you can sit him down in front of this video and he can watch this and hopefully walk away from it with a little bit more skill and understanding. Or if you're a homeowner and you're trying to tackle your own project and you see us out building retaining walls and we kind of skim over how we put together an inside 90 degree corner or how we build an outside 90 degree corner we're going to actually slow this process down and show you guys step by step what it takes so that you guys can go out and do it on your own so before we get too far into this video though if you think that a training video like this is beneficial i want to hear from you guys first off i want a thumbs up second off i would really love to hear if there's any other kinds of training videos that you guys want me to make pavers or any other hardscaping or anything else out there we, we, your imagination comes to mind so but i think the first thing we're going to do is just dive right into this video and then we'll talk about more on the other stuff so let's get into this one all right guys since this is a longer video i've broken it down into different chapters and if you're scrubbing through the video i'm going to be putting a black screen before the start of each chapter that way, if you're out in the field and you need to jump to a certain segment, you can use these timestamps or just look for the black lines in the video and jump right to them. So let's get this party started. All right, guys, one of the first things we're going to demonstrate is how we split the blocks to create a rough face on them. And we have two different options. Courtney's going to demonstrate how to use a block splitter. The first thing she's going to do is she's going to get the block close and into place by using the quick set pedal. So she brings that right up to the splitter. And then all she has to do is just basically pump on the jack until she hears a crack. And that's it it's as simple as that it doesn't take a lot long time and then actually we use the pressure release back it off and then we can see the results that we get a nice even cut but if you don't have a block splitter jim how do we split a block by hand well, it's a little tougher stand but what we're going to do is we're going to score the middle of the block and you can see we're going to score the top i'm going to pound on the top of the block we're going to score the bottom i'm going to pound on the bottom of the block and I'm going to use this wedge and I'm going to split the block in half. And what it does doing beforehand is it's creating little micro fissures, little spots where the block's going to crack, little weak points. So we'll try and get our best split up by hand right now. Okay. A 12 inch framing square worked really nice. You've got your middle line that you start and then you can start making these little fissures. Now you want to make sure that this this line is as straight as you can possibly get because if you have this line off at all, the block will actually pretty amazingly follow that line. While you're doing this, Jim, does anybody know how much a block splitter averages in price? About 2,500 bucks. 2,500 bucks? Okay, so if you don't have 2,500 bucks to invest in a block splitter, here you go, and we'll see the results. Now hammer hammer her home. So it gives us almost the same identical results as the block splitter. Show me the tools real quick, Jim. Anything special? Nope. Just a small chisel and a 12 inch framing square. All right, there we go. That's how we split a block. Now the guys from Versalock kind of played a joke on me and they painted one of their blocks gold because in the past I've said that Versalock to me is the gold standard of retaining wall blocks. But one of the things that I want to show you is they have a Versa lifter inside of it. And one of the beauty parts about this block and this lifter is instead of handling this with your nose, bare nose pickers, you put this bad boy in there. Well, why don't you guys grab this camera for me? I just want to demonstrate how we can use this lifter. 
If you come in, we put it into the top two pinholes. Come on in a little closer, Jim. We put it into the top two pinholes here. And once we're in place, then you just lift up on the handle and that creates pressure between it. And now you can lift it just like this. Of course, it is an 83 pound block, so it isn't gonna be light, but when you wanna release it, you just lift up right here and it comes, pops right off. So let's just show that one more time. In the holes, lift on the handle, good to go. Once you have your block in place, grab right under here, show, get close right under here, lift up there, and then you release. All right, one of the next things we're gonna show is actually how these blocks go together. So let's, let's pop one in place, Jim. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna lift it, and I'm actually gonna set it away from where I'm gonna end up placing it. I'm gonna slide it into place. And what that's gonna do, that's gonna knock off any concrete imperfections that are on the top of the block. Slag. Slag, yep. Slag it. And then we pin the one and four slot. Yep, because we're on half bond, we're pinning the one and the four slot. We know that that's gonna go in. We're gonna seat the block just by tapping it, and then we're gonna push it forward. And what that does, that locks the block into place because if you don't do it, Mother Nature will, and she may not be so favorable. She might move it so it's tilted a little. So you wanna make sure it's seated. All right, so one of the myths that we're gonna dispel though is we have to maintain a true half bond, and we don't. In fact, over here, we've got them on almost a three-quarter bond, and they're still gonna be okay. But let's show them how we actually make sure that we're physically connected when we're not on a true half bond. Yep, so this one's not on a half bond. It should be variable, and that's a nice thing with VersaLock. So here, I know I'm gonna hit this uh, slot below it. I'm gonna pin it in place. Now, because of the bond, I can either pin it into the four slot here or the three slot. And we're gonna wanna make sure that we grab another pin and seat it into place. Seat that pin. And then scooch it forward. And now we're still okay. Even though we're not on a true half bond, Versalox Engineering says that this is fine and dandy. Yeah, we don't have to glue it. We don't have to do anything. And you may be going, why would we even want to do that? Well, anytime that you have something like a 45 here, or especially if you have a radius where your blocks start to take on a curve, like we see over here, that bond can get off. Yep. And you just want to make sure you have four inches of overlap because that ensures that this block is pinning into both the, this block and this block below it. So you're tying the two block below it with the pin. Four inches of overlap. Yep. That's what you need. Yep. And you can keep going. Next tip. Let's keep this video rolling. All right, guys, the next thing that we want to show you is how we actually use these VersaLock standard units to build an outside 90 degree corner. So, Jim, you want to walk us through this? Yeah, so we're taking those half units that we did before and we're gonna use each half unit. And whenever you're doing a 90, you can see we flip them upside down and that's just a good habit to get into. Every time you split a unit, flip it upside down because there's little mold marks that you hide by doing that. And now we're gonna use each one of those halves in our 90s. So one split will get you one foot of 90 degree corners because you can use this piece here. You would set that into place and this would get glued. All the 90s would get glued. If you have a spec where you needed to pin, you can pin into the block by hammer drilling down into this block because it's solid. So you could pin if you wanted to. A lot of guys, they just use glue on their 90s. From there, we're gonna use the uh, repin. We're always gonna want to build from our corners working out. As you can see here, we really didn't do that. We painted ourselves into a corner because what this did was now we're gonna try to get this next block in there and we're gonna kind of pinch ourselves, right? It's gonna to be tougher to get this block in. So it's always good to start with a 90 and work yourselves in. Work yourself out. Work yourselves out, I mean, yep. And now, this next block that we split, again, we turn it upside down, and we're gonna use that, and we're gonna dovetail that corner together. Just like a carpenter does, we'd want, we wanna make sure that these blocks are together and they're, they're sitting together and they're tied together. Otherwise, you're gonna have separation over time. Okay. Right? Let's throw the rest of this one together, Jim, so these guys can see exactly how this goes. Now, after, you, after you've done, we've done two courses for them, but it's basically wash, rinse, and repeat after that, right? Right. It's just the same process. So every two courses, you flip that one half C and make it work on the other course below yep. it. 
And now we're just building out from our corners. And that really helps. If you've got two corners, you want to make sure you start on the corners and work towards the middle. And everything that we're going to be building here today is going to be used, is going to be using the exact same block. There's no specialty blocks needed. If you guys, don't worry, if you guys aren't using Versalock, don't worry. A lot of the stuff we're talking about, you're still going to have the same skills if you use some other block. But in a situation like this, it may be very likely that you have to order specialty blocks. And one of the things that I don't personally like about ordering specialty blocks is a lot of times they're manufactured in a different mold and they use different aggregates at a different time. And what and if you get really picky, and I've seen this happen, you guys, where if the if the retaining well blocks don't come from the exact same aggregate mine and the exact same mix at the exact same time, it looks like a checkerboard. So if you're ever driving down the road and you see a retaining well and it kind of looks like a checkerboard, well, that's because they didn't, the, the aggregate from the mine and the spec mix at the plant weren't exactly identical. Yeah, keep it simple, right? Use the same block that made the same day and manipulate that block so you can do your whatever you need to do on the job site and you get a better result. And that's what we do and that's how we've done it for 25 plus years with this block. All right, I think the next thing we should show them is an inside 90 degree corner so that they can kind of see that because I'm going to guess there's going to be one or two of them that might be trying to build one of those as well. All right, guys, the next thing that we want to show you is an inside corner. This is what you would be looking at right here, but let's show you how we actually build this and what we do and why we do it. So let's show them the bottom course right now. So th this block, these two blocks behind your inside corner, you will never see. This is what you're gonna see. Why do we put these blocks back here? It's just for stability so you don't have block overhanging. And you'll see as we start to build up, we'll show you a demonstration of what, what would happen if you didn't put those blocks there. Okay, go ahead, let's build her up and let's show them why we put those blocks there. You wanna get what started there? So we put the next course on half bond or thereabouts. It doesn't have to be necessarily on half bond. But these blocks would all be pinned. All the blocks would be pinned. Mm -hmm. And so say we didn't put that block there. You can maybe come around here, Stan. And Chris, as he sets it there, at some point you're gonna get this block to tip. So what do you do? Do you throw a couple of block in there? Do you, do you cut a block? We've just kind of found that it's a heck of a lot easier to use full units, no modifications, have it a little beefier corner. You know, it, it doesn't hurt to have a beefier corner. Um, usually that's where things separate, right? Yeah, and the reason we're doing this is basically if you got a, a taller inside 90, you want to have a good base for that corner to put on because there's a lot of weight in a corner. And a lot of times you'll see retaining walls fail in there because guys tend to cut corners in the corner they'll use a half block or they'll just put in base material underneath it. And if any of that shifts and settles, then your blocks will eventually rock. By building a nice beefy corner like this, you're ensured that the, the corner is gonna last as long as the rest, of the rest of the retaining wall. And then from this point, it's wash, rinse, and repeat. Nothing changes. You just keep adding the blocks in this pattern until you get to the top of your retaining wall. And again, like we said before, you always want to build in the corner and work out. Work out, out towards the middle. If you have two corners, work, to, work at one end of the corner and the other end of the corner. Work to the middle. Don't put all your cuts in the same spot. Vary those as you go. Okay, and the reason is it's just like painting a room. You don't want to paint yourself into a corner. And you don't want to come into a corner and need to put all of your modifications into the corner. If you have the, the long run of the retaining wall, you can hide and get your bond back on or get comfortable and put any cuts anywhere into that retaining wall as you're building it. The next corner that we're going to be doing is an inside 40 five corner and this is we get a little bit more specialty with this but let's put this together and show these guys what we're talking about jim yeah so this would be either your first or in this case the third course and then what we're going to do is we're going to simply butt these blocks together but you'll see this leaves a gap in the back of the block and you do not want to leave a gap where you're going to be setting this next block so either you can fill it with some type of uh, unit some type of maybe spare unit you have 
or you could fill it with gravel, you know, whatever works for you. But you don't want to leave that gap open because that's a tipping point again in, in corners. You don't want to leave a tipping point for your next block, your okay. next course. And then let's put on the next course as we go up. Okay, so in this. Now this block is a little different. It looks like a half block, but this is not a split half block. This one is actually a saw cut half block. Yep, uh, you can use a half, you can use a half unit, so you can just saw cut a Versalock in half. Yep. And you can use that for each, every other course, right? Because what you don't want is you don't want a seam running down the middle. Where there's seams, they can split apart. Just like out a carpenter again, we want to dovetail corners together so they're connected together. Right, so sometimes what you guys will see is on a outside or inside 45, they just butt the blocks together and you get this really weak point in a retaining wall and that's the last thing that you want to do by doing this you're getting it back so that everything is interlocked together but one of the things that you could do is you could split a half block to create this block but what will happen is word of caution is as you look at the face of these retaining walls you see how they have these nice seam lines that are just they flow together if you split this block, you're going to have a rough face here butting up to a nice seam line here. So that's where Jim was saying saw cut it. Or if you don't have a saw, you could order. This is one of the few occasions where you could order a specialty block. And right. what, what is that called? It's called a cobble unit. So it's basically half of a standard unit. And in this case, we had the units, the uh, specialty units, so we just used them. But you can simply saw cut a standard. And like Stan said, if you split it, the worst case scenario is you build one of these corners, you split all these blocks, and then the homeowner notices that there's little ridges in that split block because it doesn't have this manufactured edge. And now you're pulling it apart and redoing, and that costs a lot of money. But it's not structural. There's no, it's not a weak nope. point. It's not structurally insufficient. It's aesthetic yep. at that point. Yep, homeowner's eye, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, outside 45 is next, you guys. Going to show us how to mark up a 45 degree outside corner. Go for it. Yeah, so the trick to this, again, we're going to dovetail a corner together. It's going to be an outside corner. You can make it at whatever. It can be a 45, a 55, whatever you want. In this case, it's a lot easier to do 45s consistently with a 12 inch framing square. And you can see right here at the four mark where I've got a 12 inch framing square. I'm gonna butt this to the back of the block. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna allow me to get a true 45 there. This is gonna be our change of direction. This is where we're gonna split the block to get a different uh, uh, face, a textured face on this side and this side. And then at whatever angle we choose, we're gonna saw cut back. And we're gonna saw cut back so this next block can get butted up to it. Um, and then on the following course, what you would do is the exact opposite. You would flip over the framing square if I wanted this. You go to the four mark and you would mark this side and then saw cut back here. And what that does, it makes sure that each one of these faces are the same, whether it be the right side or the left side, the right side or the left side as you go up. All right, well, let's, let's do it and then let's put it together so these guys can see it in action. Okay, so now this is gonna be a rough faced 45 degree corner, go for it. We're using the block splitter. We could do the same thing with the hand chisel, right? It would be, we'd wanna be a little bit more careful if we were hand chiseling it because a hand chisel on a 45 is not gonna give you quite as good of a result as a block splitter. Yep. That satisfying crunch. We actually want to show you the difference in the look between a split corner and a saw cut corner. Yeah, so like like we showed, we took and we 45 off of the face. So this is our change of direction. And every other course is gonna be the, the different side so we can dovetail it in. And we had the guys do this and... Now this is the one we hand split so you yep. can see when we were talking about getting picky with our corners, we want to demonstrate and show the difference between a hand split corner and then actually a saw cut corner. So go for it. 
Yep. So here's our change of direction, and you can see the rough texture on both sides where they did a split and another split. And this, it's okay, but it's not great once you match it up because you've got these manufactured edges now to a split face. And this is what we're talking about. Now this is not a structural issue, but it can be an aesthetic issue for your customer. So it's something to be well aware of to make sure that you guys have happy customers. Yep. Happy wife, happy life, right? That's what they say. Exactly. Now the only difference here is we did a split where our change of direction is and we did a sock cut back. Okay. And then you can see when so, I put this next block up, how nice and tight that is. It's tighter. Tighter. It's tighter. It's still not perfect. And that's something that you guys just got to be aware of. You may have to do a couple different saw cuts to get it. So if you have somebody super picky that you just get it dialed perfectly in because even in this case, even with a saw cut, we still have a little bit of a, a nuance here where we don't have it there. And I have had customers be that picky, but that's not the, the point to this. The point to this is how we actually mark these blocks and how we actually put together a proper 45 degree corner because I've seen them where they're just, this row butts up to this row, this row butts up to yeah. this row, and you have a dead standing seam right there. And that is a failure going to happen. Yep, most definitely. It's a failure because one wall separates one way, one wall separates the other way. All right, it's here somewhere. worth pointing out this is what a bad 45 degree corner looks like nothing is dovetailed together I'm sure this was a lot tighter when they built it but you can see how it's already starting to split I could stick my fingers right in here you should not be able to do that so this wall is in a state of failure and it's never going to get better but i wanted to show you what it actually looks like when it's done wrong let's not get there addressing this video i don't want to put and i'm not trying to put any company to shame i'm just trying to help you guys build them right the right way so the next thing that we're going to be demonstrating jim is columns yep right and this for these guys, at this point, it's just a matter of wash, rinse, and repeat. Keep going back. Flip-flop yep. that pattern all the way up as high as you have to go. Boom. Boom. All right, so the next thing we're going to be doing is actually building columns, and they're a lot easier than you actually think because we're going to just be using the Versalock standard unit and splitting it straight in half but how does this go Jim yeah it's all half units and again I just get into a habit every time I do a half unit I turn it upside down and the trick to a column is to make it really easy on the guys is every split you do you separate out the lefts from the rights so the rights and the lefts and you can make these little stacks of four and after that you know a column gets built up it gets glued together each course gets glued together but if you have these stacks of four and lefts and rights you can just pick from one side and the other one side and the other and just like how the dog follows his tail he's going to be following it around the column one way and he's going to turn and follow it around the other way. and we intentionally did one block wrong because we want to show you why and you flip this is where you flip the blocks upside down as you do it but if you happen to leave one right side up we left that one uh, right side up like the rest of the blocks will show you the look that you get yeah. again all these columns they would just be glued together so he's pulling all from one side for each row so then he's got all that was all his lefts yep. and now he's going all right yep and if you keep them separated, it doesn't even matter if they're lefts or rights. You just know you're grabbing from one pile and then the other. One pile and then the other. Now, if you're constructing this for a homeowner, you would be checking square, each course, checking level, each course, gluing, making sure you don't bump them as you glue. You know, if you build too fast on too hot of a day and then somebody leans on it, you can get it to shift. So you want to make sure it sets in place before there's any weight that's getting pushed on it. And so you guys notice 
they're upside down except for this one block right here and this is why we do it you can see the marks the pin slots right here show up when you don't put them in the way we talked about how high can you build a column well you can build a column as big as you want we've built them you know 15 20 feet tall but it's been engineered and if you're not doing it just the regular way if you're not doing it, if you're just doing it with glue and gravel then i believe it's about three feet okay that you can do a column um, but we've had, you know, columns get beefier and get filled with concrete and have footings on them. We've had bridges get built where there's huge columns going up the sides of bridges and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it really is sky's the limit, but it's got to be engineered. Got to be engineered. Now a freestanding retaining wall uses the exact same Versalock standard unit that we've built everything else out here, but with one slight modification and that's to knock the back end of it off. Yep. And what they have this is where it just gets super easy. They've actually got this ridge right here and you just split that ridge off, whether you hand split it off or you use a block splitter. And then that gives you a rough face on this side and a rough face on this side as well. And then you can just stack them up straight as a straight as you want to go. Yep. And so that's all we did right here is we took and we split all of these the tails off of the block ahead of time. Mm -hmm. You can see what it looks like. So we've got a rough face on this side. And then how high can we go with a seat wall like this, Jim? Do you have a recommendation? Uh, I think two and a half feet. Okay. And then on the back side, and then you can just pin them, lock them together and that's it. And that's how you get that rough face look on both sides. All right, one of the things I forgot to mention when you're building seat walls is the rule of straight or eight. You can build a seat wall straight and have zero issues, but if you're going to curve that seat wall, don't make more than an eight foot curve. You're already splitting off the backs of the block, and if you make it tighter than an eight foot curve, you're also going to be cutting those blocks, and that's going to be a lot of block manipulation. In the next segment, we're going to show you how to make a radius, and what we teach you in that segment will apply to building a curved seat wall. So let's jump into that segment right now so you understand the rule of straight or eight. All right, so guys, the next thing that I want to talk about is making radiuses inside and outside with the Versalog block. There's just some technical specs that you should be aware of. Jim, you want to walk us through some of those? Yes, Dan. So you don't have to make a straight wall, right? You can do curves with Versalock. And in general, nice, long, sweeping curves are going to make a better wall, okay? If you have short, choppy curves, it's a lot less aesthetically pleasing. You're going to want to either do a corner at that point because otherwise it's just going to look choppy. It's not going to look right. But you can do inside and outside radiuses with no special blocks, no special tools, nothing. But what's the spec on what an outside radius should be? So an outside radius, what we want to plan for, because of our setback that you use in most occasions, you're going to set back at three quarters of an inch every single course. So you got to make sure at the top of your wall, we say it to allow for eight foot two for your outside radius to the face of the wall. The, and you can see here, it, eight foot, it's exactly closed. There's no gap. And the reason why we say allow for eight foot two, because job sites are fickle, right? If you've got a job site where maybe the homeowner looks and they want another course added on top of it. Well now, if you didn't account for a little bit of fudge factor, now you're cutting every single block to get it into place. So I wanna talk about that. What Jim is actually talking about is when you make an outside radius curve, you go eight foot two at the top, you don't have to cut these blocks. But once you get with a tighter radius, if you got a seven foot radius or a six foot radius, you have to legitimately cut the backs of all of these blocks off so that they match up and marry up tight. But eight foot two allows them to sandwich together naturally with no modifications right. whatsoever. Yep. But how about an inside radius? Inside radius, you're basically unlimited, but again, it gets choppy and you can pin at six foot at an inside six foot radius. You can still pin a block where you can still sit into the into the um, slots below it. So you can go a lot tighter with an inside radius where you're making an inside curve than an outside curve without modifying the blocks. But at some point you are probably gonna wanna opt to do, to do an, a 90 degree yeah. inside corner. Yeah, it just looks choppy if you get too, uh, if, you, if your curve gets too tight on you. Okay. All 
All right, guys, so the next thing we're gonna do is cap the wall, and we're gonna show you how we step down and make the wall really pop and this is kind of a critical point to it uh jim now versalock has now this may be a little bit unique to Versalock. they have what they call an a and a b cap and they do this so that when you look down at the top of the wall you get a really really tight seam like that yep yep and the a cap they're both 14 inches on the face it's just the a cap is 12 inches on the back and the b cap is 16 inches on the back so when you go a b a b you get a straight run and there is, you gotta watch out for caps too because there might be a manufactured edge no matter what cap you use. In this case, there is. There's a top and the bottom. And there's just a small chamfer that you'll see. It doesn't matter really if you use the top or the bottom, but once you start mixing them up, top, bottom, top, bottom, that's something that the homeowner might catch where they might catch one. Here, I'll show you, flip you one right now. Where you don't have that chamfer. And it can kind of stick out. It can be a, little, be a little detail that somebody misses. Okay, but as we look at this, we see that the caps are flush, which I personally love. It can be a little challenging when you're going around radius and curves because that's when you get into cutting them and making it and really getting the tight seams. But can we pull one of these apart real quick, Jim, and just show them if we shove two A caps together or two B caps yep. together, what it would look like in the gap that you get because it kind of leaves a, an unfinished look in my opinion. And this is where a lot of other companies start. This is all they offer at this point and you get this weird split in there and what this does is you get dirt you get rocks grass growing whatever it's just not for me but that's just aesthetics but this is what we're talking about is the aesthetics of the wall and we want to make sure that we dress this up so let's pop that back together the way the right way and then let's show them how we actually do the step downs because there's a a, a good better best way of doing the step down as well I think before we do that though, Stan, yeah. you know, one thing that you can do with caps, it, it can be flush, like you said. Oh yeah. It can be it can be set back to the wall. So it could be flush to the wall. Okay. It could be set back to the wall because you're gluing the caps, right? It can be whatever you want it to be. But I really recommend where you get the eyebrow effect yep. with the block. And there's a trick to that too, is that let's say you did everything you, you did possible to make sure you had a straight wall. And at the end of the day, there was a little curve to it, oh. right? No matter what you did, maybe Jim's something Jim's cheating happened. us to cheat. Jim's telling yeah. us how to cheat. Right, just a little, just a little. <laughs> okay. So, but what you can do if you if you set your block forward a little bit, yep. not too much, you know, you don't want it to be a tip hazard either. Yep. Because you gotta glue them and the glue's gotta set. But if you maybe an inch or so reveal, mm -hmm. what you can do is you can do a string line on the back of your block, snap a string line, and now your caps are perfect. Yes, and you can hide any flaws or imperfection. I, we just use our nose picker, so we just stick a finger in up to the first knuckle right there, and that's how we measure the depth. So as we go down the wall, we make sure that we're there. Uh, and then, but let's do, let's show them a, a good step down, a good, better, best on the step downs as well. Would you mind, Jim? Yep. So a lot of people too with their step downs, I guess here I'll just pull this apart. Yep. They'll just do this, they'll put the cap to it, right? And maybe maybe they will, maybe they won't even split the cap. Let's do this. So maybe they can see that. And you know what looks better, right? Manufactured edge or a nice split so it looks like the retaining wall. So you gotta make a choice. Now we've been doing rough face everywhere and when I look at rough face and manufactured edge, manufactured edge, let's show them what it looks like if we were gonna go the best option yeah. out there. So the best option would be take the time, split the block in half. So on a step down, you split the block so that you get a rough face, similar to the rough face that you're used to seeing in the front. Yep. Now we're gonna keep the same one inch reveal thereabouts on everything that we do. So what Jim is saying is make sure that the reveal on the front of the face is the same as on the side. Okay. And now we've got our step down. Now we're gonna, we already pre-split this cap. So we actually split that cap and you've seen us split already in the video. So that's how we get that, but let's put one more, let's, let's wrap this up. And there's, when we come to the end of a run, 
what and we got to have a small block in there we don't like to put the small block or the split block i don't care if it's a quarter block or a half block or half unit you don't put that on the end you want the most beef that you can possibly get right out toward the end of the retaining wall and so that's what it looks like that to me is how we typically dress up our walls uh, so that we have a very consistent look tight cap units rough face finish on the block rough face finish on the cap everything matches everything goes together step downs are good our split units are always on the inside our full units are always on the outside and that's how we step down and cap a retaining wall yeah and you know another just real simple trick is take your time and step back and look at it right it's really easy just to get focused on one cap one at a time you know, even just small little deviations, take a step back and look at the whole picture. Now we've covered almost everything, but there's one last thing that we can do with these units, and that is build stairs. And we can, we use the exact same unit. We use the pyramid method. It's not difficult to do. So let's go in and let's, let's uh, slap some stairs together and show these guys how we do it. Yeah, let's do it. All right. We're almost through this training and thanks for sticking in this far. If you guys have enjoyed it so far, big thumbs up goes a long way. And remember, if there's any other trainings you wanna see, let me know, but here we are. We're finally to the stairs and we have two different ways of building stairs using these same block. One is the cut in method and that's where we just put in a couple block, backfill it with soil, put in some more block, backfill it with soil. But the reason I don't recommend doing it, and I, we don't personally do it, is because you can get uneven deflection over time. So what we're gonna be talking about and showing right here is what the pyramid method, and this is probably the best way of building a set of steps, but let's get technical with this, Jim. You wanna just walk us through this yeah. real quick? And we've got a lot of different things going on, and some of it we've covered before. You know, with our stairs, we've gotta we've got dive into the grade, right? So we're gonna turn our corner. We've already talked about 90 degree corners. We've built those, you guys know how to do that. But one difference with our stairs is that you can see when you've got a retaining wall stepping back the cheek walls here are completely vertical and the reason we want to do that is we want to make sure aesthetically that our stairs uh, our stair treads don't keep getting larger and larger over time and it's going to help you with cuts too you won't have little mini wedges that you're trying to cut if all of a sudden your cheek walls are stepping back and so then we build a base a big fat platform and we extend this base all the way to the back to where we anticipate the top stair is going to be so that every step is fully supported below it so as over the course of time you're not going to get individual deflection and that it's going to compensate and be like a big giant snowshoe over the course of the ground in this case yeah and a big benefit you know we've seen guys where they've done them like you exactly said where it's 12 block deep and you know 10 stair rises tall or whatever but at some point you are going to be using a lot of block if you get into it where it's just too much block you can do it multiple pedestals so you know the biggest advantage with the pedestal is that you can get a piece of equipment in here right you're not just doing one stair tread at a time you can get you know your compaction equipment to almost make it like a small little patio in here and make sure you get good compaction right off the start and then the other benefit if you can get in here stan you see we're not just putting the block right on top of each other you see how we've got it step stepped where it's on both this block and that block well and what that does is two things is aesthetically it makes your cap so it's got an eyebrow which really looks nice right mm -hmm. but then you're connecting the block together right you're not just having individual blocks stuck stacked on individual blocks so let's show them how we put this together we have used some half seeds to throw off the bond in this case but let's just put the rest of this together so these guys can see how it actually fully goes together and jim if there's any details you want to talk us through as we're putting this go for it and like i said joe Joe's just making sure that he's being consistent with how he's overhanging this block to the block below it. And that connects all, all the block together. The Distri other, distributes the weight better. Distributes the weight, yep good, yep, good way of saying it. Yeah, so what Jim is saying is we don't just stack the blocks straight up on top of each other. We interlock them so that that weight gets connected in. But one of the things we don't do is we don't actually lock these into the sidewalls. Right. In yeah, this case, individual, it, it can go in and out independently of the wall. 
And that's a good point because, you know, right here, they did step back. If you can see where this overhangs, they made sure that this pedestal was inset a little bit. If they kept the pedestal flush, then whatever you're capping with by however much is gonna stick past. And that can be a tripping hazard. Somebody where you can jam your shin on. So you wanna make sure where your pedestal is, however your caps are fitting in there to finish it off, that you account for that. The other thing, Stan, that we could have done differently, where we already had this kind of pre-built and we, all, we knew it was gonna get put together well, but if you're in the field, I recommend where you do one wall first, then your pedestal, and then you start with this next wall. And what that does is you can butt this wall up tight to the block and you're not trying to pinch the block in together. You're not sandwiching the block. Right. So if you build the wall, pedestal, then the next wall instead of what we did here, that, that might be easier for your end user. And when you've got a taller set of steps, multiple pedestals, I did it at my own house. So I built my, my primary uh, pyramid sta staircase and then I backfilled with gravel, compacted it, and then I built a second pyramid on top of it and I connected the pyramids together. And my staircase is 15, 20 years, 20, 20 plus years old and has never changed in that entire time and we use it regularly yeah. so and that's it it's a the the it's a very simple way to build a staircase using these blocks yep it's a solid way it's better for construction you can get your compaction equipment in there and that's our training video for today a big thanks goes out to jim yeah, Stan. appreciate it man the lettuce invading the yard thanks goes out to the guys in the backdrop for helping out thank you guys uh, and if you guys enjoyed this training video, you know, like I said, thumbs up goes a long way. And if there's any other ones you want to see, let me know. But you guys over at Versalag did something special too, is you've gone through all of my retaining wall videos and you've put them into a playlist over on your channel as well. Yep. So if these guys don't want to wade through all of my videos, they can find them over on a channel that you're putting together yep. to help guys do that. Yep. As on well. our Versalag YouTube channel, we've combined all of Stan's videos on retaining walls, pavers, and we'll have that so that you guys can just rip through all of them. There you go. God bless. Go get them, you guys. We'll catch you on another one.